they've all just seen Don Quixote, of course. Um, <laughs> there it is. Look at that. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about the, the films and the, the context of your films, but I suppose this one is is it's, it's it's this is all the films of Terry Gilliam yeah. in one it's all the years of Terry Gilliam as well so, look, congrat, do you know what I think congratulations for getting this made I think it's an extraordinary piece of work it's not just what we see on screen it's called the years that thick headedness pig headedness it's stupid it's a stupid thing if you have a career luckily I've never aspired to a career because 89 was when it began, and we finally got it out in 2018. And why did you keep going? Why did you want to make this story? Why was it so important to you? I didn't. Everybody just said, don't make it. You give up. Move on. And I don't like being told what not to do or what to do, even worse. <laughs> it's, it, it's still a beautiful film. I think when you see it... This one, you, you think, well, I, I see why it kind of chimes with it, exactly your yeah, work. Yeah. Who, who are you in this movie? Where's your oh. sensibility? Which character? Which? Well, I'm both. Mm. I mean, I think that's what is important to me about Quixote, both Quixote and Sancho. It's really two sides of a person, in a sense. The practical side and the dreamer who keeps falling on his face. The practical side is the one that picks him up and keeps him going on. So I think we all have bits of it in us. Some some are the smart ones and are the fat, stupid ones. Those are the smart people. (laughs) The other one has a more interesting life, possibly, because it always seemed to me that dreaming of a better world than the actual world is something that keeps people going. And the older you get, the actual world becomes more present. So, you know, you start getting older and then you die when you actually can't believe in something better. Do you think 89, so uh, that's almost 20 something years ago, if you'd have succeeded in making You're it- You're terrible with, at maths. I am terrible at maths. <laughs> that's why I do this job. Um, if you'd have made it when you were first supposed to make it, um, would it have come out much differently to this? Is there a, a change in the emotion for this? Is a different man making it in some ways, an older man at least? I think so. A, a less smart man, possibly, is what it is. No, as it, it it grew or didn't grow, it changed over the years because, I mean, to begin with, uh, Jake Eberts, who was Goldcrest in this country, which he had produced, you know, all the things that David Putnam takes credit for. But Goldcrest was a great company, and uh, and he was the um, executive producer on Munchausen pre- uh, prior, uh, I finished that in 88. Anyway, I called him up and said, Jake, I need $20 million, I want to make Don Quixote. He said, you got the money. And it was as simple as that. And then I had to read the book. Because I had leapt into it like most people who don't, who haven't read the book. Most people haven't. People know about Quixote, windmills, da da da, all that stuff. But the book is extraordinary. And at the end of a couple of weeks reading it, I said, "Well, I don't know how to be, even begin." But we began. <laughs> and along the way, you know, I got the script we wrote that Johnny Depp and Jean Rocho and I thought was solid. And then that all collapsed and then I throw it aside I didn't want to know about it for a few years and then I'd read it again and I'd say oh that bit's good and that's not so good let's shift and in the end what we changed it into is what you saw with a man who has in a sense sold his soul an, arti- an artist who has betrayed his art and is just a commercials director a guy with talent who just wants to make money and I thought now this is interesting because uh he, it's also it's about the danger of films, what they do to people's lives. And so all this started just <laughs> uh, taking over my way of looking at the whole thing, and that's what you ended up watching. I, whether it's better or worse from the original, I have no idea. Mm. The I, Presumably, I always think this, the, 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 the documentaries that are made, that, that Louis, uh, Lou Pepe and Keith Fulton made, uh, I don't know if you've seen those ones, uh, The Lost of La Mancha, and then He Dreams of Giants, uh, which is sort of their follow-up. Which uh, is a terrible title. The real good title would have been He Dreams of Giants but Works with Dwarves. 
<laughs> That's a good title. That's a good title. <laughs> um, I, th- I think they're both brilliant pieces. You know, I, I, I've watched them both uh, both again recently. Uh, the, the, one is real and the other isn't. The one is made just up. Just like Kiwi. yes. So they're the two the two sides yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, how, how much of that? How much of, of that was interesting for you? That to see that that someone else look at your process, look at the way you were working. Does it throw a different light on it? Well, I, uh, Keith and Lou, I really love because when we were making Twelve Monkeys, I've always I'm very lazy. I don't write diaries, and my memory is terrible. So I got them. There were two uh, film students in in Philadelphia, and I said, "Here's some tape, and you've got your camera and." make a documentary about the making of 12 Monkeys. And they made a really good documentary. And then when we set off on Coyote, off we went again, and they made a really good documentary. And then we actually made the film, and they made a documentary that is not totally truthful. It's not a, it's a fiction, because what I don't like about it, I mean, what you see there all is happening, but... It was really about, can this old guy survive? And that's, I was having a fine time. Mm. <laughs> and so it's it's a f- fake drama is what's going on, it, and that's my problem with it. I see, well, you, as we can see, he's very well. Uh, <laughs> you talk about film making and the film that we, we've just seen, the two sides of it, the commercials making the film. You, you, you've done commercials yourself. You, you, you talk about someone That's my shame. <laughs> Well, they're very good commercials, aren't they? They are. Yeah, they're really good. <laughs> and they buy you enough time that you can waste another few years waiting to make a movie. <laughs> you, what, what strikes me and, and is extraordinary about you, Terry, is that you've never sold out. Your films re- retain the essential you know, elements that you'd want from a Terry Gilliam film. You never get disappointed. You're never like, oh, he's, he's, not, doing this, he's not doing the stuff we want. You've always managed to do it, whether people want you to or not, or will pay you to or not. Well, How have you despite kept- my efforts to sell out, I've failed, <laughs> basically. I'm very Quixote-esque in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> How have you, How have you oh. kept to that? I don't think I have a choice. I really don't. I just can only do things that I become obsessed about or passionate about, something I really believe. Something that nobody else could make is kind of my way of thinking because there's hundreds of better directors out there, technically better, but it's the stories I want to tell that, and I get fixated by things. I think it was, it was actually up through um, Munchausen, I had always been one of the writers of it, so these were things that were coming from me. And it was only after the difficulties of Munchausen, I got very depressed, uh, and a script turned up that was, well, actually, no, to be honest, two scripts turned up. One was for the Adams Family, which they wanted me to make, and there was this other script thrown in just for my agent threw it in. And it was Fisher King, written by Richard Legravides, the first script he had ever written. And I read this thing, I thought, fuck me, this is so good. The characters are so brilliant, the dialogue is beautiful. And so I went and made the first film that I wasn't involved in the writing, and I also made it in Hollywood, a place that I refused to work previously. So it... And it worked. It's a really good film. <laughs> and we loved The Fisher King. We loved that that script. Kind of would have quite liked to see The Adams Family made by Terry Gilliam as well. I think we all can sort of say that right now. <laughs> he was like, really? That would be great. There's still time. That issue, that no, days back. Tim Burton's doing it. Yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> the... That, that's really interesting. We, we, we're going back to, you mentioned Munchausen, and we've just seen Jonathan Price here. Uh, and if we go back to Brazil, uh, of course, that's a relationship that you've had yeah. for a very, very uh, long time. Tell us a bit about working with him. He's fantastic in, in Quixote. Maybe he's become my Marcello Mastrioni, mm-hmm. <laughs> a man who admires Fellini, as I do. It's, you know, Jonathan is spectacular. He's such a good actor. And... It was interesting with Brazil. The producer at that point was trying to get me, and I was doing videos of a lot of aspiring young actors. There was the guy who was on a television show opposite another guy called Tom Hanks. And the guy who isn't Tom Hanks has been forgotten by history. Uh, There was also a young uh, guy who just made, 
his first film that was causing some some noise, Tom Cruise. And these people were all interested in being the character that Jonathan plays. And 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 Jonathan, I don't know, I'd been sitting in a cinema or at some screening at one point with him, behind him, and I Jonathan, he had done I, what I had seen him do, I thought was wonderful. And I had a screen test with Jonathan having put these other people either on the tape or I'd talked to. And Jonathan had just finished shooting uh, uh, a version of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the old medieval fat guy. Uh, and he had put on weight for the part and he had a monk's tonsure. He looked terrible. He, Maggie, my wife, provided him with a blonde wig that I think was Eric Idle's from one of our films. <laughs> and I did a screen test with Jonathan, and he was just fantastic. And I had my first fight with Arnon Milsham, my producer, saying, this is the guy for the part. No Tom Cruise, no Tom Hanks partners, <laughs> nothing. And, and I insisted on it because Jonathan, and he was wonderful in the film. He was just breathtakingly good. And why not work with a great actor? I mean, they do half of my work, basically. Mm -hmm. I don't direct. I choose wisely. <laughs> but it's really interesting hearing you arguing with your producer. I assume that was not your first argument with a producer. What? <laughs> what? What 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 is that process? Because that you know that the producers will want one thing for money for different reasons. How do you um, you know stick to the, the, the instincts you have or, uh, and seed certain battles, or maybe you don't seed yeah. any? I don't know. No, I mean, it's really important when you make a film, as far as I'm concerned, is to make sure all the people you're working with are trying to make the same film. And often you find producers at the beginning are just fantastic. They're so enthusiastic. This is exciting. They haven't really looked at the script properly. They, and, or they just know that I can get a name actor involved. And that's when the problems arrive. Somewhere along there, it starts realizing they're going that direction, I'm going that direction. And that's when the problems arise. Luckily, most of these problems arise after you've finished shooting. And it's only when you're in the editing suite that they arise. And then it's a bit late for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's Timing is very important. And for me, I always think, who is going to be in the foxhole with me during the final battle? And if I've got Jeff Bridges and Brad Pitt, it's likely the three of us will win. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a fantastic, you just mentioned Je Jeff Bridges and Brad Pitt and T Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks, who you didn't, and Jonathan Price and Johnny Depp you mentioned earlier. You've had a, a, a career of working with some fa absolutely fantastic actors, never had a mm. problem attracting them to something that yeah. presume is a little bit different to what they're doing the rest of the time. But I think that's why they come on board, because so many get trapped in being who they are perceived to be, which is usually a, a very limited spectrum of talent in there to work with. And so if I can offer them a part that is so far apart from what they've been offered before, they're excited. Mm. And it's, it's actually a good sign, because if they are, you know these are actors and not stars. There's a difference. And it's nice working with stars because they get, bring you the money, but it's better to have an actor who's a star as opposed to just a star. And is that something you have in, in a private conversation with them beforehand, that this is what we're going to do, we're going to go on a journey mm. together, I'm going to make you do things that you don't normally do, and they, they say, yes, let's do it, or do you have to pull it out of them? Is it a gradual process? It's, I don't know, I've, it's always having a dinner and talking about what we're doing, and it's very quick one knows you, you're talking to a, a familiar or a similar thinking person. It was interesting with, with um, 12 Monkeys. <laughs> uh, Bruce Willis, I had met when we were making Fisher King, he had come on the set to say hi to Jeff Bridges and we talked a bit and he was busily dieharding again and again and again. And, but I liked him because he talked about this scene, I think it was the first Die Hard, and I was saying, there's this scene in that movie that I really like. You've been running around the, uh, while they're blasting uh, all the glass partitions in the office building, and your feet are full of glass shards, and, and, and you're on the phone to your wife, and you're weeping. 
and I said, that was such an amazing scene. And he said, that was my idea. It wasn't in the script. And I thought, okay, you're not the guy everybody thinks you are. There's something else here. So I said yes to him in 12 Monkeys. Even though he was going to play a part, there was almost the antithesis of what he had been playing. A man that's totally internal, lost, not the man in charge. But he was a big star and the chance of getting the money was greater. And then young Brad Pitt turns up in Hollywood, I mean, in, in London here, and we have dinner. And he's, I really love Brad because he comes from the Midwest, I come from the Midwest. He wanted to be an architect, I wanted to be an architect. We're having a great meal. And then I said, what do you think about the script? And he said, I think it's wonderful. I'm really keen to play James Cole. Well, I said, well, I'm just giving that to <laughs> to Bruce Willis. And I thought, that was it. And he said, well, I really want to be in this film. And so I said, come on. And off we went. And it was it was actually scary because Brad had never played a motor mouth character like, like mm -hmm. he's playing in that. He had always been very laconic and cool. And, and he worked his ass off. He, he just worked so hard to prepare for what he does as Jeffrey Goins in the film. And the first day of filming is the first scene you see him in the film, and he's explosive. He's all over the place. His head spinning, and and it was just wonderful working with him. And what made it even stranger is that just the week before, or two weeks before, Legends of the Fall came out, and Brad, who had been deemed to be really a good actor in good films, suddenly became a huge star. I mean, previous to that film coming out, we could walk around Philadelphia or even London. Nobody bothers him. Eh, what big the minute that film came out, we were in Philadelphia ready to start shooting. And suddenly we had to bring in so much security because girls were willing to throw themselves off the bridge. He couldn't move. It was just this guy who loved being able to walk around cities and see people and totally relax now was a prisoner of his immediate fame and it's horrible you've worked well we mentioned some of the, the great actors and that is wonderful hearing about 12 monkeys which was my brother's favorite film when we were growing up my brother, yeah we had it on vhs he wore it out i mean i've seen that great fantastic. script it's a great so, script yeah. Any, anyone's fantastic anyway i just thought i'd mention that it's quite lovely to hear the, these stories about it um is, is there an actor that you you said that jonathan price maybe was your marcello mastroianni is there an actor that you found is the sort of you know correlative of, of you can really intuit the what you want from a performer it's jeff bridges he and i were like brothers i mean i've even seen photographs on the set i think i looked more like his brother than bo bridges does <laughs> and we just hit it off and jeff is an extraordinary actor because Everything is grounded, it's solid, it's fantastic, and he's just a joy to work with. He's just, what was wonderful on, <laughs> on Fisher King is one reason I, I wanted to work with him is that he, I needed somebody to ground Robin Williams and myself. Robin and I became just ridiculously silly the moment we were together, and we ended up in the stratosphere. It was just absurdly stupid. and and. And Jeff was the anchor. They just held us to the ground. And that's why the relationship between the two of them is so wonderful in the film. And it's real because uh, Robin just so admired Jeff and vice versa. And I think he was so happy to always be pulled back to the ground. And, and that's why the performance is so good, so good. Sort of talking to you now when we talk about the sort of the double acts that, 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 that recur throughout the, the pairs that recur. Mm. Then we talked about Quixote and, uh, and Sancho, the both sides of, of you and hearing about Robin Williams, the antic side and then the sort of more grounded side. Is that, is that why you like those double acts? You can get both sides of Terry Gilliam in there? I don't even think that's the first time it's been mentioned. Mm. <laughs> I don't think like that. I honestly don't. I mean, obviously it's intuitive because I don't, I don't intellectualize what I do. I've never wanted to. I don't want to understand what my my skills are, in a sense. I, technically, I know certain things. But beyond that, I like the mystery. And what was interesting in, in, in Fisher King is what I didn't know until the film was finished, that Jeff 
had become me. His movements, everything about him was, he was emulating me, and I didn't realize it. And I don't think he did. That's this how the relationship got interesting, how you get involved with somebody and you can't see where one of us stops and the other begins. I say it because you're, you're a filmmaker that makes fantastic images, you know, and, and conjures up fantastic yeah. images and, and shoots for fantastic images. When someone sort of probably say to you, we can't afford that. We can't go for that scene. You can't have a balloon. You can't have more people coming. Uh, and you, it, you, know, you go for them all the time. But you're also, every a, a film director must be a very practical person because they know this. They know that the money's yeah. not there. They know that it's a difficult thing to do. So you, you must be fighting your creativity and comp and trying to balance that with uh, the practicalities of, of 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 shooting. I think always, I've always what I'm trying to do is more expensive than the money we have is almost invariably the case, uh, and. So I, so I re bridle against the moments when they say we can't afford to do that. I said, what the fuck? It's in this fucking script. Uh, what do you think you're just saying? You know, it, I get really crazed. I just, but what it does do is it, it uh, triggers so much adrenaline in me, this hatred, the, this wanting to kill the bastards that are stopping me from doing what I do, that I somehow come up with solutions or maybe I don't come up with them, maybe they're forced on. Somehow they happen. And invariably, most of those solutions are better than the original idea. Uh, can we do Munchausen in the story? Okay. Uh, please. Here's how. Munchausen, okay, I storyboarded the entire film. We, uh, I had a producer in Chinichichal in Italy. Uh, I was working so in a country of a language I didn't speak with people that were far more experienced than I was, and they'd all worked with Fellini. They were his people. And and the producer was a man whose great heroes were Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and Dino de Laurentiis. <laughs> and he, uh, he was German as well, on top of all that. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he, and it was crazy, because it was all worked out. And, and we had raised $23.5 million from, from Colombia in, in, in America. And the first budget, based on all my storyboards and all the discussions, the uh, accountant said, well, that's gonna cost $60 million. He was fired immediately. And then another one was hired. We went through about four accountants, all coming lower and closer to the 23 and a half million. Finally, one said, oh, that'll cost 23 and a half million. He got the job and off we went. And it was a complete disaster. And we, after six weeks of a 21 week shoot, all the money was gone. Bingo, we were just doing the storyboard. And so the film, finance company who are the film bonders came in and they said all right we stopped the whole production uh we stopped shooting we and here's the deal the baron cannot go to the moon is what they said i said whoa hold on here a minute he's not going and he's on the moon in the storyboard and the script sean connery had already agreed to play the king of the moon, mm -hmm. and there were 2,000 people on the moon. All, when the eclipse occurred, their heads and their bodies would separate and get lost and never get back together properly. Uh, that was just a little idea that we had. And it's, <laughs> and it's like, it's 2,000 people that were gonna be doing this. Here's my Cecil B. DeMille moment. And, uh, and they said, you, you can't go to the moon. Now, it was so ridiculous, because the film had been stopped dead and Charles McEwen who wrote it with me we're sitting in my office like what the fuck are we going to go to how are we going to the Baron is going to go to the moon and I said in the end okay here's what we're going to do we get to that part in the film with all the grandeur and the glory that's going on and he flies to the moon and we can do some, a bit of animation there's the moon he comes and he walks into my office and I'm sitting there with Charles, and we're saying, and we'll read the script at that point. We will read the scene that we were supposed to be shooting until they shut us down. And then we'll go back to the film as done. And that was my plan. <laughs> and, and, and in the end, it didn't work out that way. In the end, Sean Connery, 
agreed that being king of two people on the moon was not the same as being king of 2,000. So I just threw away several zeros. And we got the two people on the moon. And luckily, Eric Idle had become a good friend of Robin Williams. And in many ways, Eric should get the credit for saving the movie because he convinced Robin, come on down, work with Terry. And Robin did. And that's how we finished the film, with two people on the moon, not 2,000, with Robin as king. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite sequences in the film yes, because yes. Robin is ad-libbing like mad. Those are not words we wrote. That's <laughs> Robin on fire, and it's wonderful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hearing you talk about that in 2000 and going to the moon, um, and you know, thinking of your your cutout animation, which is probably where we many of us here first saw you and first saw your imagination with the pythons. How has the filmmaking changed for you now that digital and CGI has come in? You seem to still use the um, do it the old way, uh, if I may say. How, uh, do, do you would that have saved you a few quid? Would you would it would yeah, have your I, imagination been different? No, it's just a tool. and I use more CG than people recognize. I'm, I, I really make it look bad. <laughs> so they think it's something else. It's, no, I, I, these are just tools. I think my problem is that CG makes everything possible, and that's kind of limited real imagination. Because, okay, I mean, I've been... I've said publicly I'm tired of Marvel movies. They're technically brilliant. They're phenomenal. If I could do those movies, say, 30 years ago, I would have jumped right in there to be doing them. But I think just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And that's where I feel, at the beginning with CG, we all were excited with, say, Jurassic Park, because we hadn't experienced before, but I think we know <laughs> inside that's just all fake. We're actually watching animated films mm. without the freedom of animation and the silliness of animation. And I think we kind of know it. And that's, that's why, say, in the case of Coyote, that's all real. And I wanted to make it real. Everything about it we shot on location, ba ba ba. It could have been more fantastical, but I was trying to balance what's going on with Marvel. And I don't know, I want gravity to exist even in the cinema. And when I watched Johnny Depp sword fighting somebody on the yard arm of a pirate ship, he doesn't slip. Gravity, there's no gravity in the world there. There's none, all the greasy bits, you slip and fall on your face going on in that world. And I think we're watching animated films. Avatar, okay. <laughs> okay, I won't even go into it. I would rather watch Pinocchio with, uh, with like, uh, yeah, Guillermo's the, 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 Guillermo, you It's, want to it's stop honest. It. The other stuff isn't right. Avatar, the only thing I really liked was the one real kid that's dragged around with him. I, I was fascinated with what he was doing. That was a real person. These other things are not us or anything even close to an animal. It's interesting. <laughs> If anyway. we, well, I talk, talk, talk about the the, 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 the cutouts. Let, let, let's go back. Because, I mean, hearing you in charge of sets, hearing you doing these fantastical things feels like the most natural thing and, you know, your, your, your natural place, your happiest place in the world. But was that the idea? Did you always want to be a filmmaker, a movie director? I was obviously attracted to films. I think I have to give Walt Disney and his Pinocchio for, you know, seducing me into the world of, animation. I just thought, a stunningly beautiful piece of filmmaking. And that's, that's kind of it. So, But then I never thought I could, I didn't even know how you got into filmmaking. We lived in the San Fernando Valley where the studios are around there. And my dad was a carpenter and I always wanted him to get a job at the studios. I thought maybe somehow there'd be a connection and one could be dragged in. He never did. Uh, so I never thought it was a likelihood. I mean, I think after, even after college, I was still thinking cartooning, magazines, the things that I could actually work on and have control. Film was so far away from anything I dreamed of, to be honest. Uh, I don't know, there was one thing in, um, he sent me some questions in advance. <laughs> I have an answer to one of them. Which he, because he said, I'm not gonna answer any of these. <laughs> And you asked me about what film changed my life. Yes. And it was 
it was um, Paths of Glory, Kubrick's Paths of Glory. I was, I think, 13 years old, uh, and I was out in the San Fernando Valley on a Saturday matinee, all the adults would bring their kids in and throw them into the cinema to get them out of the way so they get down to the mall. And, and I, I mean, I loved watching films, so I was in there with all these kids running around and Paths of Glory came out. I thought, oh, fuck me. This is, <laughs> suddenly movies were about something. They weren't just Rock Hudson and Doris Day entertaining me. Has anyone, does anyone know Kubrick's is the first World War movie? They, they seem to yeah. be making it again right now. It's, it's well, they keep the making, the trying to keep making war movies. Yeah. And tra- they're, but you have to watch Paths of Glory. It is a stunning. It's about injustice. It's about the brutality of a system that is just, people are counting for. And about authority. I think that film set me on the path of being an anti-authoritarian right. for all my life. Because you're watching authority, the generals, and the stupidity, the arrogance, and the lives sacrificed, thanks to those people. I've never... That was the film that I felt movies are worth making. <laughs> Kirk Douglas, uh, yeah. is it? it's an extra- extraordinary film. Do you think it'll be shown here in this cinema? I, Part would, of the repertory. Yeah, well, it, the, the films of Terry Gilliam has chosen. Terry Gilliam. <laughs> yes, we've got, we've got, yes, they've yeah. already, it's, Ginger, said, it's done. Watch it, it's <laughs> extraordinary, bit of work. Um, and it's extraordinary that they are doing World War I movies still. Uh, yep. um, when, we are very lucky to have you here in London. You've been here how many years? 67. 67. Your maths are terrible. Yeah, I know. So, I, yeah. <laughs> 67 years. Um, it's not like 60. I came here in 67. You, you came that here That only in works at about 40 something, 50 something. Maybe yeah, it's 50 older 50. than me. 50, yeah. 50, <laughs> well, yeah. A lot of it. Yeah. Um, I'm delighted. Why did you come here? And why did you stay? I don't know. <laughs> uh, actually, about a year previously, maybe a bit more, I hitchhiked my way around Europe. I escaped America. There was a little war going on in a tropical land called Vietnam, and I had had enough of America, and also the magazine I was working on collapsed, so I had no income. But I had saved a bit of money, and I hitchhiked around Europe for five months, and I loved it. I I was so astonished, a world that had been there long before America existed, a world that was full of real castles, not Disneyland castles. And, and, and the people, every time I crossed the border, they spoke a different language, they had a different culture. I loved this, this was just fantastic. And, and so I came back to America, worked in advertising for 11 months and said, fuck this, I'm out of here. And came to England, because it was one of the languages I almost spoke. Uh, and I got to England, I thought, oh, it was the first time I felt free because I wasn't responsible for the country. America, I felt as an American, I bore some existential responsibility. But here I was free, I didn't fuck it up, somebody else fucked it up. <laughs> it <was> like, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's it, and then I stuck. But <laughs> given your, you mentioned the anti-authoritarian nature, the streak in you, know, to come to yeah. England, which is the establishment place, and then to you know to mix with the that Cambridge lot that you fell in you amongst know, six white males or five white males. I was I was almost one of them. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was the sixth one. Yeah, okay. How, yeah, that, yeah. that sensibility. Tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about that. How did that? How did that even become part of a well, that I mean, group? In America, I just loved Ealing comedies. I was a huge Anglophile. I loved the comedy of the country. It was this weird self-deprecating. I loved the class system because it's easier to make jokes when, okay, he's upper class, he's middle class, he's uh, lower class. You know where they fit in the system. So it's easier, it's more mechanical, the jokes you can make. And so I got here and before I, while I was working on this magazine in New York, we did fumettis, which is the Italian word for puffs of smoke. And it's basically like comic strips, except it's photographs of people. So you're basically making films that don't move. You're taking still photographs. People still speak with balloons. And there was one they had writ- we had written about a man who f- has an affair with his daughter's Barbie doll. The details 
are a bit complex. We never show them, <laughs> luckily. Uh, and and there was a group of young comedians that arrived in New York on the coattails of Beyond the Fringe. Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Jonathan Miller, blah, blah, blah. And they were called Cambridge Circus. And there was one guy who stood out of the crowd as he always has, John Cleese. And I got him to be in one of our fumetti, that fumetti I was describing, for, where he would work for $15 a day. And, and that's, we became friends. And then I hitchhiked off to Europe. He went to Chicago, worked in magazines. And then when I finally turned up back in this country, uh, he was on the Frost Report doing I'm Upper Class, I'm Middle Class with the two Ronnies. And I was still in magazine work doing cartoons, drawings, editing. And I wanted out and I called him and said, John, you're in television. Can you introduce me to somebody in television? And he gave me the name of a producer, which took me several months to finally get the guy on the phone because he was very good at hiding. And he turned out to be an amateur cartoonist and he liked me and he took in a couple of written sketches I had done and forced them upon, uh, what was it? Do not adjust your set. Mike Palin, Terry Jones, Eric Idle. And that was the beginning of what became Python, ultimately. And they were quite happy to have your... Nope. <laughs> no. Eric was, because Eric always loves the exotic, the new. And I had a sheepskin coat that I painted, and I looked exotic in those days. And it's like, and he dragged me in. And there in the back of the pub where they were uh, drinking was these two rodental kind of people, little... And they, and they were very territorial and didn't like this exotic sheepskin person coming in. And that was Mike and Terry. <laughs> anyway, I started, I did my first cartoons with them, and that was the beginning of everything. Uh, that presumably, uh, you, know, you did the sketch shows uh, for a long time on the, on the, on the telly flying circus, and, the, and then you got to make, suddenly they got asked to make movies. Was it their, their idea to make movies? Or someone said we should put you in and put you not in a movie? How did the, the actual movie making come about? Because some of those are, we, we forget how, how amazing told, they are. And, you, and that's where you started directing. This is what's good when, when the tax of the rich reaches 90% of their income. And that's what it was like that in England way back when. It was at 90%. And there were all these very, very rich, famous pop stars, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Genesis, record labels, all were looking for tax relief. And they were all fans of Monty Python for the television shows. And they invested in, uh, what was our film? Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And they gave us whatever it was, 400 quid to make it, uh, I don't know, something. very small budget. But they gave it to lose to solve their tax problems. Unfortunately, the film made money and really fucked them up. <laughs> but that's how it started. So there's the money and there's Terry Jones and I both thinking we want to be film directors. We thought we could do it better than the TV show, we could blah, blah, blah. We were so full of our own arrogance. And the group agreed that anybody named Terry could direct. There was two of us, and because they knew directing Monty Python is a dog's body job. <laughs> but Terry and I got out there, and we did. We learned on the job, and the film was success. And did you? So you both directed Grail. Yeah. And did you both do Life of Brian? No. <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> right. I, mean, I, 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 had, I had snuck off in, in the interim, done jabberwalking mm. on my own. And I realized, unlike the Pythons, all these great actors um, would listen to me and do what I asked. So I said, fuck the Pythons. I said, I'm on my own. <laughs> and so Terry did Life of Brian, which I think is our best film, frankly. But you're in it. I mean, you get to... Yeah, I, I get to make a fool of myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get to hide behind lots of grotesque makeup. Yeah. <laughs> the so when Jabberwocky, you're you're up and running now with uh with your with your own career and your own ideas uh, yeah. as a filmmaker. That did that very quickly become this is this is what I'm going to be doing. This is easy or, or you know could you could you say then that you know whatever years it is now, fifteen films later, you be here with a great body of work no. behind you. No, no, we're still just playing around. It was the fact 
that life of Brian became the moment when George Harrison entered our lives seriously. And he put up the money to make the film and to get it released. And then we had formed a company called Handmade Films, which was George and George and Python. And and Dennis O'Brien, who was the the, the the capo of the thing, the financial man, and became our manager, he wanted to do a film that had all the Pythons in. And and I was trying to make Brazil. And there was no interest in Brazil because what's that? And and I one weekend I came up with the thought of Time Bandits of a kid. So it's a, a movie that's going to be shot from a kid's point of view. And I didn't think a kid could hold the whole thing together. So I surrounded him with a gang of equal-sized people, uh, the Time Bandits, and and. And that's what basically happened. We made the film. The script had been turned down by every studio. The finished film was turned down by every studio. And George said, well, fuck them. Uh, I'll put up the prints and advertising. And we got involved with a small distribution company that hadn't had a hit in 10 years. We put the film out in America, and it went to number one and sat there for five weeks. And that was basically the beginning of me being credited as a film director because there was no explanation for it. The studios, what the fuck, who is this guy? He must have the magic touch. Uh, and, and that's really the kind of, yes, it really is you become a talisman for success when you've done something like that. And I was able to live off that for a couple of years at a couple of films before they discovered the truth. <laughs> <laughs> How often have you had to sort of re pick yourself up and dust yourself off. Like you say, Munchausen, there's always a sort of financial uh, bit that gets you annoyed or can't you can't or clips your wings or you it brings you into contact with someone. How, how often have you used to sort of reset and sort of say, I'm going to go again, uh, you know, f fear and loathing in Las Vegas, for example. Is it a sort of change doing yeah. Hunter S. Thompson and yeah. yet it ends up filtered in through that, that Gilliam lens again and looks like a Terry Gilliam movie? I don't know. I just... I, I had a good run during the 90s, mm. let's put it that way. Really? It goes on. You get on a roll, and it seems to work, and then good things approach you. They actually do. You become a magnet, and you get better scripts. And so things like Fear and Loathing, oh, you know, Fisher King, 12 Monks, these things arrive, and they tend to be things that, strange enough, nobody else wants to do <laughs> because they're not... You know, the current hot idea. And I'm the guy that, I was the, I was the dustbin for really good scripts <laughs> where they ended up ultimately. And that's what was wonderful. But as, there was a role I was on there. So I make a film, it's successful. You get another few. And then certainly sometime, sometime in the 21st century, it all started getting more difficult. <laughs> because the films didn't make the money for various reasons. There's so many reasons why a film is a success and a failure. It's not very simple, but at least you need somebody or distributors who can actually afford to promote the film. Mm -hmm. and, because it's not always about you. You mentioned stars bringing things earlier, yeah, but you've no. had you know huge stars no, in, in no. films. They don't do so well. Um, Brothers no, Grimm, no. for example, with uh, you know Matt Damon and uh, no. extraordinary you know cast. And no. so you don't, even after all this time, you've got you don't really know. You don't. Nobody knows anything. Is the reality, and that's why you can only do things you believe strongly in, and hopefully you're not alone in the world. And I'm, and if I just go. Hopefully, I'm in touch with enough real people as opposed to... Hollywood is a very tiny little village that controls so much of the world and uh, how the world is perceived. But it's, it's maybe 5,000 people that are making all the decisions and have all the money. And so it's... I've had friends who... I mean, specifically a casting director I work with in America all the time. And one of these really intelligent people with great taste, uh, wisdom, and an awareness of so many things in the world. She wanted to be get into production, and she finally did years ago at 20th Century Fox. She was an executive producer. Um, and within two months, 
this woman changed into somebody who only believed what was possible at that time point in history to get made, not what should get made. And that's what happens in Hollywood all the time. And at any one moment, it seems everybody in this little village sees the world through the same filter. And, and so we live in a time now where Marvel Comics, which are successful at work, and it's, it's been interesting in the last few years, it's coming apart. This year was more interesting than the previous years because it becomes ticking all the boxes because that is the current way of thinking. We should be doing these things. And this year was a bit more interesting, mm-hmm. the films that came out. What, with you, um, you mentioned your, your, you know, your casting director and you mentioned the, 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 the films that, well, we, we've seen how Terry's films are sort of unique voice. I can't really sort of compare you to other filmmakers in a way but you mentioned Fellini was someone that you yeah, that you really yeah, admire yeah. what were the who were the other filmmakers oh. that you that you've admired but and what have you taken from them I- I- into your into your own that I don't know yours is so unique I can't really sort of see that oh yes that's taken from so and so well look at Brazil I'm stealing from the tracking shots in Paths of Glory boom simple it's, it's no it was Kurosawa Buñuel Fellini, uh, who else? Oh, I've, I've got a thing called Nominal Aphasia. The shutter just came down. Okay, Stanley Donnan. Fantastic, Stanley. Stanley Donnan. He made all those great musicals. I was, I was at uh, uh, the Sundance Institute years ago where I met this young guy. They didn't, they had, he had a script nobody knew what to do with. And Stanley Donnan was in the group of the professionals. It was me. Volker Schlondorf, who made Tin Drum, mm-hmm. and, St- and Stanley Donnan. And the script came in, and Stanley and Volker said, I don't know what this is. I just saw this the most brilliant thing I had written. It was so odd, and, and there was this young guy who had written it, so I became his friend, apparently, and, and he, I ended up getting a credit on the film when he finally made it. It was Reservoir Dogs, and it was Quentin. <laughs> but nobody knew what to do with Quentin in those days. This energy, this intelligence, this passion for film, and they didn't know. But when we were there, I remember there was an evening when we watched Stanley, uh, uh, lots of clips of his films, and I realized I should have credited him for Fisher King. Yes. Because those films are so beautiful and romantic and musical and... I suppose they had much more of an effect on me than I had. But you, you have a dance it. sequence in Grand Central Station. Yeah, that Stanley Donnan. That's, that's an MGM yeah. Stanley Donnan musical. Because that wasn't in the script. That was the one. That was the only bit in that script that I changed because it was Richard Legravenez's very first script, and it had been picked up by the studio Columbia, and then they tried to make it into a commercial script. And they fiddled and fiddled, and it was just stupid. I mean, what I had read, I was still impressed with how brilliant the characters and the dialogue was. But I said, Richard, can you show me your first script? And I mean, this is, and because there were some really stupid things. There was a whole, it became uh, a heist film, trying to steal the Holy Grail on roller skates. Uh, this is really kind of dumb. And he then showed me his first script, Untouched by Studio Executive's Nervous Fingers. And, and his desire to succeed and make the film, because you end up compromising. And you don't think you're compromising, you're just taking good advice. It's not good advice. It's advice made based on fear of the executive who's advising you losing his job. That is where the fear is coming from. And, and he had shifted the whole thing into something stupid. So we went back to the original script and that's what we did except for the Grand Central Station thing because we were there looking at locations and it was just at rush hour and we were on on the, the mezzanine up high with the producers and all. I said, because the original scene was basically about Jeff's character turning up there, meeting Tom Waits, begging, and this black, poor black woman was singing. And it, it, it touched him and it changed him for a moment. That was all that was happening in Grand Central Station. And I thought, I was up there on the mezzanine with the producers looking, 
And all it was rush hour. All this is going on, all these people rushing past each other. They said, wouldn't it be wonderful if each of them passing somebody else felt immediately fell in love and started dancing? And this producer said, wow, what a great idea. I said, well, we're not doing it. Because this is Richard's film. And he didn't write that, so I'm staying out of it. And, of course, they pressured me into ruining the scripts <laughs> by putting in the big dance sequence. And it's, you know, and here's the great thing about movies is we made that film sh shown in New York and I, first thing I heard about a woman coming home after watching at night and she walked and she walked past her house. She kept walking and walking because the film had t transported her. And the great thing is that now Post Fisher King, on New Year's Eve, they waltz in Grand Central Station. So films can do good things. <laughs> <laughs> You're very romantic about movies, Terry Gilliam. Yeah, I, I, I try to fight that. <laughs> try to be more manly, <laughs> tougher. No, but yeah, they, they're frustrating when you reach a certain age and you can't do them as quickly or as easily as you used to. That's what's. Mm. That's why one becomes more romantic. Along the way, it was just flying, excitement, making things happen, and then you get older and older. And after thirty years of pissing around with one film, you get not. I wouldn't say forgotten. You, I seem to try to be forgotten, but it doesn't happen. There's always somebody who says something. <laughs> Do you still find going to the movies, watching the movies, a romantic exercise, a romantic pursuit? No, it's more disappointing. Oh. And it's partly because I think I've seen too many films. And I think films are very much about specific times in your life when whatever it is, and you find a film that embraces what you're feeling. And those are the ones that you remember most of all, I think. I just... I mean, Bardo. Have you? How many have seen Bardo? The, the inner reach there you film. Go. With there's the... the problem. Just a few of you. And there are some of the most extraordinarily beautiful cinematic moments that I've seen in years in that film. But it's three hours long. Mm. And that is a huge mistake. I mean, it, but it's worth, it's, it's on Netflix. And it's on Netflix. Mm. Yeah. It's not on a big screen. But it's not sit close to your screen, <laughs> like that. I saw it. On I know. Screen. Yeah, I got lucky. But it's it's. I mean, I'd say I'd say the first twenty minutes, half hour, is as good as you'll ever see for cinematic experience, and then it goes on and on <laughs> and on. <laughs> it's like, come on, and there's 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 sort of a sickness has taken over. Babylon, on. Um, and on and on. Irishman, on. I mean, it's the idea of three hour films is a bad idea. That's all I can say. Mm. I don't know how long Paths of Glory is. It feels. It's probably 90 not. minutes, is it? No, I, maybe it is, you know, yeah. No, it's, it's probably. Got that I bet it's 100 yeah, max. Yeah, I mean, films that really can punch their weight and really leave it a mark on you. And it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know. Length is not really everything it's can you maintain the audience's you know, involvement mm. you know, it's like, and at three hours you just get tired and bladders need blattering <laughs> 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 have you ever fallen in love at the movies what? have you ever fallen in love at the movies fallen in love with the movie or during the movie yeah both <laughs> I don't I don't know I think there's there's been plenty of moments when I just, I don't know if I fall in love, it's usually just amazement, uh, where I'm just taken by an idea, a way of looking at the world that oh, never experienced, and those are the things that just blow me away. I mean, as Kurosawa did that, I mean, his use of cameras, you know, Seven Samuel, any of those films, they're, they're wonderful, and then it's very interesting how then Sergio moves in and carries on, and they're never as good as the original. They're good in their own right, but I'm afraid the originals have the impact. And I think that that's that's I I feel like a junkie who can't get a fix is what I feel. I really want to experience films the way I did when I was 20 years old. Mm. 
hard. And, and maybe that's what we we all fall in love with them at that stage, at that age, and yeah. then you're trying to chase the yeah. chase that that hit that dragon all all the way through, trying to recapture it. Yeah. I mean, your films still seem to be about the urge to recapture that moment to chase that yeah, dream. I'm, I'm trying to find some innocence out there that I can, you know, <laughs> degrade. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions I did send you was about film posters because I feel that images yeah. are something that's so powerful yeah. to you and, and you know start you off. As, did you have film posters? No, nope. uh, never. I no, think. that's I, I mean, it was, I made, you made me think about film posters because I didn't have because I mean, they were I didn't have posters on the wall. I suppose I just I'm not sure if I couldn't afford it. Probably that was the main reason. Mm. But no, but the ones I remember are Saul Bass's uh, film posters. Man with a Golden Arm, Anatomy of a Murder, mm. Vertigo. This was a great, great poster maker. But the ones I really like are the ones done in Poland and yeah. and Romania. Check. Oh, they are just stunning because they're they're abstract. They leap away from it. I mean, Hollywood has just become over the years. It just put the faces of the stars up there, and it's always made me crazy. Oh, because this. I just want to lure people in via an abstract route, and we're be we're losing abstraction. Everything is so presented. It's so so. Oh, a nice. We are becoming emojis, and I <laughs> we're up there being stupid, <laughs> looking like idiots, and that's kind of what it feels like. I mean, the battles with Brothers Grimm had a huge fight because it was just going to be he and Matt. And Heath didn't want it. He wouldn't be photographed properly. Uh, and but it's it's boring. We uh, I've got an ex somebody who worked with me on Holy Grail, a great designer, Lucinda Cowell. She made some of the best posters out in Hollywood. And the poster for Brit Brothers Grimm that she made is just so utterly beautiful. It's red writing in this dark wood. It's full of. It has emotion, where the others are not emotion. They're just, we're selling you, you, and you. And that's it. And that's not good enough. There's, I, it's, it's, it's a thing that's, I suppose, what, with my films, I'm trying to move from the, the literal to the slightly more abstract, where your mind has got some space to play in. Mm. That's all it's about. And do, do, you ha do you have any now? Do you have them in, in Gilli Gilliam Towers? Do you, do you have posters of your own films or other people's yes, films? Yes, I'm afraid I do. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have all of them, you see. Oh, yes, too because many, our walls are limited, you see. <laughs> you, need to be, you need to be extended. There was a great poster for um, Dr. Parnassus that was never used. It's Lily Cole scrunched up Actually, she's, she's naked in some kind of an Alice in Wonderland thing. It is a stunningly beautiful poster, but the producers wouldn't go for it. <laughs> One of the other questions I sent you, because I'm always intrigued, your sets, uh, I've had the privilege to be on them once, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of extraordinary places. And we get a little glimpse into your, your sets with some of those documentaries, the, 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 the La Mancha, etc. Would Is there someone that you would like to go to their set? You know, if you could travel back in time, anywhere in the world and go to a film set and see, see a, a scene being made or a film being made, who would you go to? I don't know. Maybe Dr. Caligari to see what that looks like in, in, the, in the reality. Uh, Look back to German Expressionism. German to, Expressionism is a great... I mean, that's where Brazil was born, in German Expressionism. It's And it's, again, that's that thing where... And almost everything I've done is a bit theatrical because... I'm not trying to be real. I'm trying to be, that's what I love about theatricality and what I love about German expressionism. It's another level and it leaves space for each of your imaginations to go. And so each of you should experience a different film. And I love the idea. My version is real shit. Yours might be better. <laughs> and you would have loved it in Berlin. Yeah. I could see it in Berlin in the tw in the twenties. Oh, there. Wow. Yeah. Fritz Lang and everyone. Oh, oh, amazing. Yeah. You'd have had a great amazing time. time. Yeah, you'd have been all right. <laughs> but there. I couldn't get a job because they were doing that kind of work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Terry, uh, they're about to. You're, you've got a whole season uh, of films here at the Garden Cinema, which is you know fantastic. What do you think when you see, you know, 
that you, your films gathered together. Do you see a, a through line? I mean, there's me throwing up sort of odd theories about the, the double acts, and you go, oh, when, when you see them to get I'm not going to watch the whole series. Fuck, i got a life to lead. <laughs> 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 now, what I do like is I don't watch my films after they're finished because it's been such an intense period and and you just want them out of your life and I've, I like the idea of waiting 20 years and then watching them just like a punter and I've had to <laughs> this is the advert this is the advert in the piece here because Criterion Collection are, are releasing I think next month or is it month after both uh, Munchausen and Time Bandits. And so I've had to go and look at the, the, them and see, adjust any of the grading that needs or anything. And both films have blown me away. I was almost like a kid again because <laughs> I'd forgotten they were that good. And especially a film like Munchausen, was, which was a complete and utter nightmare to make. And and it's one that I've stayed away from because I didn't, as the result of the making of it being so complex and painful, I didn't think I could judge it objectively at all. And so I stay away. And while I was sitting there watching the credits, I said, this is fucking wonderful. I mean, and I don't know who made it. That's what I'm going to find out one day. But it, it really feels that it's so wondrous and everybody is so good in it. Everybody did a great job despite the nightmare situation we were all involved in. And that's that to me is magic. Well, I'm very glad we could track down the, the hand behind those films and all the others as well. I, I'm glad you're glad we found him as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that person is, of course, Terry Gilliam. Thank you. Thank you.